Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Penn Museum. <clears throat> My name is Dan Rahimi, and I'm executive director for galleries here at the museum. And it's my pleasure from time to time to introduce speakers in this series, and, and that's what I'll do tonight. Just a reminder first, um, after the talk, there'll be a question and answer period. We love questions. Just raise your hand, and someone will come with a microphone, and um, then you can speak into the mic so everyone can hear. Um, the other note is that the next talk in this series is on May 1st. Um, the Stuff Beyond the Great Maya Cosmos with Dr. Simon Martin. So we change gears every time. But it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce Lauren Ristvedt. And Dr. Ristvedt has been working as an archeologist in the Middle East since her days as an undergraduate at Yale, where she began to dig in Syria at Tel Leilan, the ancient site of Shekhna, and then later Shubat Enlil. Uh, a super important site in the Middle East and a recently dug one, too. She then went on to receive her PhD at Cambridge and continued her work on Syria with a focus on <coughs> state formation, collapse, and regeneration in the second millennium BCE. And then in 2006, she began an archaeological survey in Azerbaijan and she received funding from the National Science Foundation to excavate Olan Kala, an Iron Age fortress in Nakhchivan. She is the author of four books, last I counted, there could be more, and uh, dozens of articles on her excavations and on subjects such as archaic states, ancient imperialism, social resilience, and ritual and performance in ancient Mesopotamia. Dr. Risfit is an associate professor of anthropology at Penn, and she is the Dyson associate curator here in the museum. In her curatorial capacity, uh, she took responsibility for many sections of our new Middle East galleries, and that's where I got to work with her, which was great fun. And her work there ranged chronologically from prehistoric settlements in northern Iraq to Iron Age nomads and empires in Iran. Her thematic contributions are seen in all parts of the gallery, and she really guided us in matters of geography and environment, subsistence, technology and religion, history, and everyday life. In the gallery project, Lauren Ristick was the advocate of the individual in prehistory and in the ancient past. That's how I think of her, actually, as the advocate of the individual, um, always striving to find the person, the actual person behind the artifact. And I do remember one day we were working on an early section in the gallery. She picked up the model of a cow, a little ceramic cow, and said, look, a child played with this. So Lauren's here tonight to talk about the stuff of archaeology and introduction. And please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. I, I think that's the nicest introduction I have ever been given, as well as the most comprehensive. Dan also is alone in actually correctly pronouncing the names of all the sites I've worked at, which are all really difficult, so quite impressive. So when I was first invited to give this lecture on the stuff of archaeology, I took a deep breath. I was quite flattered to have been asked, but I really had no idea what I could talk about. The stuff of archaeology is almost everything. And at first I thought, well, should I just present some pot shirts and some sewn tools? And then I thought, no, no, that would be way too boring. So what I wanted to do is to talk about what is, for me, the stuff of archaeology and what got me interested in archaeology in the first place, which is that I feel that archaeologists tend to ask big questions, and then we have a lot of stuff, but it doesn't tend to talk to us very well. So we have to find pretty unique, creative ways to make it speak. And then what we finally do, of course, is try to put together all of these different pieces of evidence to craft stories that make sense of something, that try to get at answers to those big questions. So what I wanted to do today 
is basically take you through three pretty recent new techniques in terms of expanding the stuff of archaeology. And I wanted to talk about how these techniques have been able to change and revise the stories that we tell from both the very large scale to the individual. Again, to get back to um, the introduction. So I wanted to talk about these three questions. I'm drawing from my work in Syria, my work in Azerbaijan. Um, and then the final thing I'm talking about is something that really I have no connection to, but I find it a really fascinating and creative excavation. And I think you'll enjoy hearing about it as well. So we're going to start again from the large scale, the collapse of an entire empire, an empire that Mesopotamian archaeologists often claim is the world's first. Um, then we're going to be on a sort of slightly smaller scale, talking about the people who live in what is probably the first fortress in the Caucasus. So it's the first political center and how they come together and create that community. And then finally, we're going to talk about Richard III, which I hope you enjoy. I enjoy Richard III. All right, so we're starting with paleoclimatology. The place is Tel Leilan, and the empire is the Akkadian Empire. Um, it's not very large by today's standards of an empire, but this is the first time that what we think of as southern Mesopotamia, what later becomes Babylonia, and northern Mesopotamia, or later Assyria, are united. Before this, we basically have coalitions of city-states that are of different sizes. And suddenly, we have something which is much, much greater. Okay, the sure. Um, maybe some. Thank you. <laughs> So when Mesopotamians, later Mesopotamians, thought about politics and thought about empire, this is where they looked. For nearly 2,000 years after the fall of the Akkadian Empire, people composed literature about it, particularly about two of its kings, its founding king, who becomes an exemplary king for all later Mesopotamian rulers, Sargon, and his grandson, the fourth king of the dynasty, <coughs> Naram-Sin, who later sources blame for his fall. Um, and this is one of those sources. It's called the Curse of Akkad, or the Curse of Agade. So the end of the Akkadian Empire is a historical question but I actually came to it from a very archaeological place. My first ever excavation in the Middle East was when I was an undergraduate at Yale in the late 90s. I went there. This was actually part of the first trench that I ever dug. I had no idea what I was doing, and I had no idea that I would wind up 20 years later be still showing pictures of this. But basically, what we found at Tel Leilan was something that was really hard to understand. And it was a really large building that had never been finished. So it took us a few years to really accept that it had never been finished. But in some ways, this is what you see here. You see stone blocks that are laid out, a shirred layer that's put on top of them, brick course, and then it just ends. And it ends in this column of dirt. And so when we first wanted to figure out what had happened at Tel Elan, we actually looked at this sort of column of dirt. So what you see here, these are people living in the lower town of Tel Elan from about 2600 to about, say, 2200, 2150 BC. There are streets they build, ash lenses, all kinds of things. And then over here, is when they come back to the site around 1800 BC or so. And in between is this 300 year period where the site is just completely abandoned. So the first thing we did was trying to think creatively, 
we found a soil scientist to look at some of that soil. And what she found, she, when she looked at it under a microscope, was that it was made of a lot of dust-blown particles, what are called aeolian deposits. And so in some ways, I think this got us thinking a little bit about the Dust Bowl. So northeastern Syria is not a desert. As I, don't, I feel like everyone always thinks the Middle East is going to be all desert. But actually, this is an area that looks a lot like Kansas. It's where a lot of the wheat production in Syria has usually been. It's a big breadbasket. When you're there, you just drive through lots and lots and lots of wheat fields. And so in some ways, looking at this sort of evidence, we were thinking, OK, so what's going on? Why is there all of this dust when we don't really have it at other periods? We don't even really have it after the second millennium BC site is abandoned. So we started to look creatively. Um, we considered some historical sources. So we looked at the Curse of Akkad, because it's actually the source that's the closest in time to the Akkadian Empire. And we sort of decided to take seriously some of its lines about drought, about prices changing, about hunger. And the director of the excavation, Harvey Weiss, began to work with paleoclimatologists to see what could be figured out about the climate of the Middle East over the short term, which for us is really the last 5,000 years or so. So he worked with people using these various techniques. And most of what they were doing is looking at places where there are long-term records of the Earth's climate. And a lot of this is really, it's, it's basically all chemistry, except occasionally when it's botany, as I say here. Um, but basically, the chemistry part comes from lakes and from glaciers, and also from seas. So these are places where sediment is laid down year after year. There are small animals trapped in them, and the shells of these animals provide a record of the changing oxygen. You can look at the changing oxygen isotopes, and you can get an idea of precipitation changes. So we started looking at this first, of course, as close to Tel Elan as we could. Um, and that's kind of here. And as several records showed a possible drought event happening about this period of time and lasting for a while. So one of the things that has been important in terms of archaeology and climate science in the last 25 years or so has been understanding that climate change occurs even during periods that are usually thought to be pretty, pretty good, right? You know, pretty stable. So if you look here, this is the glacial period, right? But this is the period we're in now. And there are a lot of ups and downs to it. So Tel Elan is in a place, again, that's a lot like Kansas or Oklahoma. But again, like Kansas or Oklahoma during the Dust Bowl, short-term droughts can really affect the ability of harvests to succeed or fail. This really mattered for the Akkadian Empire um, because the reason they were in northeastern Syria in the first place, probably, was to gather you know, economic goods, right? You know, that's the whole story that we get from the Curse of Agade, and that's what we see archaeologically as well. So in some ways, what I want to do right now is flip the story a little bit. So not think so much about the kings of Akkad, but think more about the poor people who are living at Tel Elan, who suddenly have to grow crops for tribute, try to save something for themselves and to have a harvest the next year, and what that would mean for them. So of course, they're in this violent situation. We have archaeological evidence of the conquest of Syria. This is from a site called Tel Bazi on the Euphrates. 
And we have really good evidence at Tel Elan of basically economic exploitation. So what we see, and in some ways this combines the two themes. So this is a kind of huge fortification that goes along the side of the Tel and creates this really heavily fortified administrative complex. Up here in the left corner is actually a stone grain measure, which holds precisely the daily ration in Akkadian texts of grain delivered to workers. And much of what we found were these tanors, these ovens, which were probably used either to process grain in some way, to bake bread, but they're on a huge, they're on an industrial scale. It's clearly not just for the consumption of people in this area. And we have some evidence from graves at the site that the Akkadian Empire was not really a great time to be living in this city. So we find higher amounts of signs of infection and inflammation. There's um, a study, a master's study done looking at the teeth, found that there were decreasing amounts of, um, well, they found, first of all, that there was stress. There were signs of stress during childhood, so that people were probably less well-nourished. Um, they also found from the dental calculus that they seemed to be eating a less varied diet. So there's some evidence that probably people in this area are not hugely happy about being subjects of the empire. So to bring it back, in some ways, looking at the Akkadian Empire from this new vantage point helped us to understand the collapse in a broader way. It provided a new context for the historical sources that we had already had. Um, but of course, climate is never simple. It's never just a case of there's a few years drought and then everything ends. And yet, I think in this situation, it probably made less sense both for the Akkadian kings to continue to hold on to this area and for people living in this area to continue to be subjects. So it seems that what most people at Tel Elan did is what a lot of poor farmers have often done throughout history. They voted with their feet, they left the empire, they left the site, um, and this is part of probably what led to the end of the empire. <clears throat> All right, so that story comes from work that I did um, a fairly long time ago. What I'm going to tell you now is actually the work that I've been doing for the last few years. And it's, it's very exciting because it's the work that has been done by a number of PhD students who've worked on the project as well as a couple of postdocs. And that's work that we've done. So we're now moving again to Azerbaijan, one of those places that no one ever you know, thinks about for Azerbaijan, so sort of north and east. Um, and we're moving just a little bit in time. So basically, we're starting during a period that's still probably affected by that kind of 300-year, slightly drier period, and we're ending up much later. Um, and what we're interested in is the start of this fortress in Azerbaijan. This is the landscape. It's a really beautiful place. Um, and particularly what we're interested in is who founded this early fortress. As far as we can tell, this is the earliest fortress in the Caucasus. And it's one of the few places where there's actually evidence for settlement during this time period. So in this area, during that sort of 300-year period, we lose basically all evidence for actual permanent settlement. What we have instead are lots and lots of very, very wealthy graves. And then later, in the late Bronze Age, sort of a thousand years after this drought period, we suddenly have the appearance of these fortresses and probably of several different kingdoms that also become, begin to be integrated into the larger Mesopotamian Near Eastern world. Um, they wind up becoming Urartu. So 
I feel like, for me, the problem with my research has always been that very few people know where Azerbaijan is, and almost no one has ever heard of Urartu. If I worked in Russia, things would be a little bit easier. The Russians basically excavated Urartu in the 19th century and then into the 20th century, and so it's famous. Everyone has to learn about it in school books, but you know, I'm not Russian, right? So no one knows it here. But Urartu is an empire that's basically the only real rival to Assyria during the early first millennium BC. If you guys have been in the Middle East galleries, Urartu is quite possibly the empire that destroys Hassan Lu. You know, it's hard to tell. But Hassan Lu, you know, our famous site, is very much between Urartu and Assyria. So in some ways, what we're looking at when we're trying to understand this early fortress is who are the people who start creating fortresses? Um, we're really looking at the early prehistory of Urartu. So, and these are some sort of attractive Urartian things to get you interested in Urartu. Um, all right, so. Here we are in Nakhchivan at the site of Gizgala. Here you see the remains we have for the early fortress. Here you see remains that we have of the settlement that's near that fortress, was probably part of a larger complex with that fortress. It wasn't that large. Tel Elan is about a kilometer squared. So Tel Elan was a real city. It's about the size of Philadelphia in you know, 1750, say, right? It's, it's, it's kind of like colonial Philadelphia. This, you know, it's like, it's, it's big for the area, but it's about 10 hectares in size, so that's about 240 acres. So it's not that big. Um, but it's cool, because no one else has settlements. We also have a lot of cemeteries. So one of our questions was, you know, who is building and living in these fortresses? Since normally, we don't find a lot of evidence for the actual people when we see the fortresses. They're probably empty most of the time. So we came up with a creative approach to getting at these people, getting at their life ways. It's always been really hard for archaeologists to tell if someone was a farmer or a pastoralist until pretty recently. Um, so what we did as part of this project was basically take the, skele the human skeletons and the animal bones that we excavated and look at them, analyze them using isotope analysis. So we were looking for four different isotopes that tell us about both diet and movement, where people are at different times of their lives. I think this is really cool, actually. This is um, one of the postdocs who did some of the work at the lab in OSU. And these are three of the people who were involved in, we had to do a huge survey across Nakhchivan to get samples of water and soil so they could get isotope baselines. Um, and they did that. Um, so basically, the way isotope analysis works is this. The isotopes that we're really interested in are carbon, oxygen, and strontium. So, Carbon is basically um, brought into the body through the various foods that you eat. We're especially interested, or it's very good at telling people if they're eating a diet that's mostly dominated by wheat and barley, those are, um, or mostly dominated by tropical grasses like corn and millet. This is important here because we have both millet and wheat. Um, oxygen and strontium are incorporated into the bones and the teeth from the water that you drink and from the <coughs> crops that you eat that are grown in the soil. So strontium is an isotope that will replaces a certain amount of calcium in bones and teeth over time. Um, and it's incredibly particular. Strontium levels really vary geologically depending on the age of the rock. Oxygen, at least in this area, tends to vary according to altitude. This was nice for us. 
because one of the things that we have are valleys and highlands. And we would expect if we have nomads who are moving with their flocks, that they're probably moving between the tops of the mountains and the valleys. So one of the things that we wanted to do was sample very carefully. So try to sample places in the body where these isotopes were incorporated at different times during an individual's life, and to see if we could get at both sort of long-term life trends, but also seasonality. You know, could we see people moving from the hills to the plains or not? Um, so what we saw was that for the animals, carbon and oxygen isotopes varied inversely. And that was sort of interesting because it suggested to the zooarchaeologists that what you're seeing is that in the summers, the animals are probably being pastured up in the mountains. And then in the winter, they're probably actually being foddered. They're probably being kept down in the lowlands and fed millet, which is cheap, easy to grow in this area, a summer crop. Um, there's little evidence that the sheep in this area are moving long distances. They're probably just really moving between this valley and the nearby mountains. The evidence from the um, human skeletons were a little bit more complex. So one of the things that we did was compare a couple of different groups of tombs. So I'm going to talk about this group first. These are along, you can sort of see it here, but they're along a seam up in the hills. They're quite visible, they're quite high, so we call it the highland group. These guys are actually located down in a kind of little crevice between these various hills. So we call them the lowland group. And then this guy out here seems to be located just outside the fortification wall of the settlement. So here we have the highland group. We have some more pretty stuff. This is why we excavate tombs. Um, and this is some of the analysis that we did. And so what we found was that actually the people buried in this group are slightly different. They seem to be probably family groups in that both skeletons in one tomb have pretty similar life histories based on the strontium and oxygen isotope analysis. In the other tomb, there are three people, two adults and a teenager. And these guys actually are from outside of the valley, probably outside of Nakhchivan. They're probably from northern Iran, just a little bit south of where we are. And we can see that the adults grew up there. Um, the child was born in this area. We can you know, tell that from looking at the teeth, or at least was in that area until he was seven or so, six, when you start to lose your baby teeth and get your adult teeth. And that gives you a record of kind of early childhood. Um, and then he later in childhood went back probably for a couple of years to wherever his parents were from, and then they come back to this area where they die. Um, the lowland group looks pretty different. The tombs look different, first of all. They're much closer together. Some of them actually share walls. And they seem to be around perhaps this tomb, which was the richest tomb that we found. Um, that's the sort of fairly rich tomb. You can see there are lots and lots of pins and some weapons and pots and you know all kinds of things. Um, and these, as you can see, are individual burials. They're not group burials like the other one. So what we found, or what Celine Nugent, who did this work for her PhD, found when she analyzed this material, was that the people buried in the lowlands had moved less, um, less over the course of their lifetime than the people in the highland group. They were probably just moving between the valley and the nearby uplands, and they weren't even doing that very often. Um, their diet contained a large amount of millet, so again, they're probably eating the millet in this area, and they're probably staying here in the summer. The final person 
that we looked at was this burial just outside of the city wall. And he's very different from the others. First of all, there was nothing in this burial. The positioning, the way that his hands are so close together and his feet are so close together, suggested to Celine Nugent, again, the bioarchaeologist, that he might have been tied. Um, his hands and feet may have been bound. There's evidence for injuries on his skull that would have been fatal. Um, and when you look, especially at the strontium isotope, he is totally different than any, everyone else. So he's this crazy outlier. And he's this crazy outlier because he's from a place that's at least 100 kilometers away. It's probably, again, in um, Iran, but in a different part of Iran, sort of the city of Jolfa on the border. Um, and he wasn't in this area very long. He certainly wasn't there for a couple years because nothing from the geology of this area had been incorporated into his bones. So he seems to have been a stranger of some kind, um, perhaps an enemy, and that might explain his burial place and the fact that it looks so different from other people in the group. So the implications of this for what we sort of set out to figure out were basically that the people who probably lived in the settlement, I think, are probably the lowland group. They're closest to the settlement. They're closest to the fortress. And they're actually more local. They're probably relying more on farming than I would have predicted before we had done this analysis. At the same time, there are pastoralists, there are nomads present in the area, including people who are traveling fairly far distances over the course of their lifetime, although usually shorter distances from year to year. And the relationship through these, between these groups, as far as we can tell, doesn't necessarily seem to be antagonistic. The only evidence we have for a possibly antagonistic relationship is, of course, with that last burial, the stranger, who probably, again, is coming from another lowland group. So he's another person who's probably living in some sort of settlement, mostly a farmer, not a nomad. So this is quite interesting because it shows that we don't have to see nomads and farmers as being enemies in this time and place. And it's also interesting because it gives us insight into the actual life experiences of people that we wouldn't have had otherwise. All right. So with that in mind, I'm going to move east and north quite far and move ahead in time. Um, yeah, you know, what, 2,000 years or so? And we're going to focus on the lifetime of one man, 32 years in the life of King Richard III. So we're going to Leicester, England um, in the 15th century. So, I wanted to talk about this because actually this excavation gave me some of the ideas of doing the isotope analysis that we did for our excavation. And I just think it was done really, really creatively. And it's a kind of crazy story. So in 2012, um, on the 527th anniversary of his death in battle, at the Battle of Bosworth, King Richard III's body was found in an excavation in a parking structure in Leicester, England. So um, the whole story is kind of crazy. Um, <laughs> but of course, it sort of starts here, right? Um, in that certainly all I really knew about Richard III was Shakespeare. And over time, there's been a debate between people who are against Richard III, symbolized by Shakespeare, who in his famous play, really kind of his first great play, it's one of his early plays, has the hunchbacked Richard III kill his brother, the Duke of Clarence, by having him stabbed and then drowned in a vat of wine, kills his brother, who's the king, by telling him about the first brother's death, you know, murders, of course, his two nephews who were put in his care, in the tower, um, and then finally poisons his wife, right? So in some ways, um, <laughs> sorry, I put this in here because apparently, I, I didn't know this until I started doing this, but apparently Game of Thrones is 
very loosely based on the War of the Roses, right? <laughs> you all knew this? Wow. Um, and of course, Richard III, you know, he was symbolized by the White Rose, he was from the York contingent, and his death ended the War of the Roses, right? Um, and in England, it's also this marking point of the end of the Middle Ages, because with his death, um, in the rise of Henry VII, Henry Tudor, it's a new dynasty. It's the Tudors, right? It's a totally different kind of early modern world suddenly. Um, but in general, we see Richard III in popular culture both in terms of Richard the villain, and then there are a surprising number of people who want to redeem Richard, feel he got some bad press. Um, <laughs> and so there are actually two societies that exist to try to untarnish the reputation of Richard III. One of the societies are known as the Ricardians. They're actually apparently the largest kind of amateur history society in the world. Um, and they come into this story in various ways. Um, I don't know if anyone has read The Daughter of Time. I, no one? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. I was thinking, like, I loved that book when I was a kid. Um, but this is one of the books that really sort of pre uh, presented the other side. It's a novel. It's a detective story. It's sort of fun. Um, so anyway, debating Richard III's legacy actually started early. There is one of the sources for his reign is a historian named John Rouse, who actually presents two very different pictures of Richard, one while he's in Richard III's employ and one when he's in the employment of Richard III's successor, Henry VII, right? So, so I, I think given this, we have to take everything with a grain of salt, right? So this is what he says about Richard when Richard is alive. You know, great praise, great ruler. And then this is what he says about Richard <laughs> when Richard is dead, right? And you know, he even changes things that he well knew, right? So for example, he has Richard rule for three years and a little more, because that's how long the Antichrist is supposed to rule in the book of Revelations. Well, Richard III, and again, you know, he was at his court, was king for two years and two months. But I mean, he's making his point, right? Um, so it's hard to get a sense of who Richard III really was. And because he was never really expected to be king when he was a child, there's not a lot of details for his early life. I mean, we know something about the last two years of his life when he was king. We know something about his death. But he also was a bit of an enigma, partly because so he was the last English king to die in battle. And he was one of the only English kings whose grave was unknown, or rather, unknown until 2012. So beginning in... Um, 2009, oh, sorry, I forgot. I wanted to bring in each of my techniques for this last story. So I thought I could bring in paleoclimatology because one of the things that's going on during the period of the War of the Roses is it's the start of what historians call the Little Ice Age. Um, and, and of course, we all know now is the winter of our discontent, so, you know, nice. Um, and, you know, the 15th century is kind of a bad time in England. We have this long civil war. There's also just the fact, as you see here, that the population of Europe really plummets in the 14th century. And it takes a while to really recover. Um, and we can see this in graphs of population of England as well. And there are a lot of reasons for this. I mean, of course, the population plummets partly due to the Black Death. But it takes a while to recover, quite possibly due to drought, poor harvest, and the political unrest during this time period. Of course, climate change doesn't always lead to unrest and chaos. There's, in fact, a new book out. It was reviewed in The New Yorker last week, arguing that the Little Ice Age actually is the reason for the rise of the West, uh, because it, the poor harvest basically led people to trade more. And so it favored cities like Amsterdam, big trading entrepot. But in this case, it was probably a little problematic. All right, so the search for Richard III's grave started in Leicester. Um, and it took a while 
for people to become interested in this search. It was spearheaded by a woman named Philippa Langley, who was a screenwriter, an amateur archaeologist, and desperately tried to find sort of real archaeologists to do this dig with her. She had trouble convincing people because there are two stories about Richard III's grave. So one is that he was buried in Leicester, but then when the church he was buried in, or rather it's a chapel of a monastery he was buried in, when um, the monastery's lands were dissolved um, later during the reign of King Henry VIII, his bones were taken out and thrown in the river sore. All right, so this is like the first strike against everyone. Um, but she persists. There's some evidence of where this church called Greyfriars was, because there's still a street named Greyfriars in Leicester. Um, so this is what, and Philippa Langley has a good idea that if they found a skeleton, they could actually prove it to be Richard III's because someone, an amateur genealogist slash mitochondrial DNA aficionado, has found <laughs> the, I think, 13th generation descendant of Richard III's sister. Um, this is important, right? Because they later also find, you know, possible kind of people on the male line. But, you know, normally if someone says, says they're your mother, they're not lying about it, right? Well, thought, paternity is a little bit harder to prove. And in fact, it turns out that there are false paternity events, as they call it, or, you know, various periods of infidelity. Um, in all of the paternal lines that are supposed to lead to Richard III, but the maternal lines seem to be seem to work out pretty nicely. So this is the mitochondrial DNA sampling from one of the descendants of Richard III's sister. All right, so they begin digging in the car park to see if they can find Greyfriars Church after raising money, um, both from television and from you know the Richard III Society. Um, and they, amazingly enough, start finding evidence of the monastery. And it turns out that actually one of the first things, one of the first places they open, this is the car park, before they start the search, and they actually find the grave right under it, like right where that little letter R is. Um, they come down on these leg bones. It takes them a while to become interested in them. But amazingly enough, they turn out to belong to Richard III. And we know this, or they first, expect, first suspect this because they see that the skeleton has this really pronounced curve. And of course, you know, Richard III is supposed to be a hunchback. Um, it turns out that he actually wasn't a hunchback, poor guy. Um, he just had really severe scoliosis that he probably got as a, you probably started as a teenager. Um, the second evidence that this body might belong to Richard III came from the types of head injuries he had. So there's a Welsh praise poem that describes his death as having his head shaved. And what they found actually was that some of the bone had in fact been shaved off from the blow of a halberd. Um, and then they got some radiocarbon dates from the bones and found out that, you know, it was certainly possible that they were of the right date. Then they did the DNA analysis. <laughs> so they found these people, Wendy Doldig and Michael Ibsen, one was from Australia, one was from Canada, both happened to be living in London at the time. Um, they also found some possible male line relatives. They got everyone to agree to have their DNA sequenced. They then sequenced the DNA of the skeleton. This is um, Turi King, who's the archaeogeneticist who did the work suiting up to make sure there's no contamination. And kind of amazingly, they found a um, incredibly high percentage of a match with the mitochondrial DNA of the mother's line. They also found some other information. So for example, um, Richard III is often depicted as being dark, with sort of dark hair and dark eyes. But actually, they found out that 
There are no por portraits surviving from his time. All the portraits we have are from later. Um, but that this is probably the most accurate portrait that shows him with light eyes and lighter hair. He was probably blonde as a child and definitely had blue eyes. So this is a facial reconstruction that they did from the skull. Um, and then the part that I really liked was the extremely fine-grained isotope analysis sampling they did from his, um, as, as you can tell, since I've already talked so much about this, right? Um, so what they were able to do is trace where he had moved during his life. Um, they could see that he had been born in the east of England. We know this, right? So that, that's nice. Um, but then they saw that he had moved to the west of England by the age of seven, which was something that actually hadn't been known before. Um, and then they were able to see when he moved back to the east of England, probably in his later years, after 18, when he's an adult. They were also able to see all kinds of evidence of his diet, and particularly how it changed in the two years that he became king. So throughout the course of his life, there's increasing evidence for carbon and nitrogen, which actually suggests a diet that's quite high in meat and fish, right? So that's, a, that's the diet that rich people eat, right? You know, poor people just get to eat porridge. Um, ribs, turns out that the, the stable isotopes in your ribs tend to only be incorporated the last few years of your life. And those results are really high. And it suggests that he's eating more and more fish as a king and probably waterfowl as well that would have similar rates, like peacock and swan, because you were allowed to eat that if you were fasting, you know, as a Catholic during fasting days. Also, there's increasing levels of oxygen isotopes in his ribs, which was weird, right? Because it seemed to suggest that he'd moved to the west of England where it's um, wetter, but we know he did it, right? Like, we, we know where he was the last two years of his life. It's the only time we actually have any clue where he was, right? Because he was king. We know that he was in London. We know that he went on a progress. We know he spent some time in York. We know he was in Leicester. Um, so it seems likely that this actually comes from drinking a lot of wine, <laughs> and particularly wine because of the high water content of the grapes. Um, we saw that despite his sort of rich diet, he was infected with parasites. Not, not too badly, no tapeworm, but evidence for roundworm. They took samples of the soil around where his intestines would have been. And as part of the work, the Richard III Society also commissioned a psychological profile <laughs> from the psychologist at the University of Leicester, um, who looked at documents from his reign and concluded that he was probably not a psychopath, since he seemed to be upset when his son died. Um, Scoliosis probably didn't form his character too much because it was something that had happened when he was a bit older and he probably simply bore it with fortitude. Um, but there's definitely some signs of rigid moral values, um, perhaps a belief in justice and a tendency to see the world in black and white. So anyway, Richard III becomes slightly more complex. So to conclude, um, I just wanted to you know, reprise some of this a little bit and talk about the ways that genetic analysis can actually help us identify individuals and give certain information about them, how they looked. Um, while some of the isotope analysis can let us see movement, both over the course of someone's life as well as during shorter periods, um, and we can also look at how diet changes, and how diet changes over time in really complex ways. So basically, I wanted to just introduce you again to some of the things I found interesting in archaeology right now and tell a few stories of where archaeology has gone in the recent past. So all I have left to do really is thank all of you as well as the people whose work I've drawn upon here, and ask if there are any questions. <laughs>
Any questions? Any questions? All right. Okay, so when you are talking about doing the isotope analysis, right. uh, is that, so what I think is the case for carbon dating, that you're looking at the differential densities of two specific isotopes of the same element, or is it the case that you're looking for the absolute density of some specific isotope? And if so, what's the mechanism for particularly carbon informing mm -hmm. diet? Right. Um, okay, so for carbon-14 dating, you're looking at an isotope which is not stable, right? An isotope which decays over time. <coughs> Um, and that's, of course, how carbon-14 dating works, right? It takes advantage of this instability. What we're looking at instead are stable isotopes of carbon when we're doing this isotope analysis. So we're looking at the proportions of two of the stable isotopes, two of the isotopes that don't decay over time so that we don't have to worry about that. It, yeah, it's one of the confusing bits about how, how to deal with this. I saw in that one of your first slides about the curse of Agate, uh -huh. answer, that uh, there's gifts from the people from the black land. Are they uh -huh. referring to Keme, the uh, Egypt, the black land of Egypt? No, I, I don't think so. We'll have to go back and look at it specifically. The places they're referring to in that curse of Agade early on, um, sorry, I'm just going to go up to bring it up, are... Um, I mean, they do refer to the Indus Valley, which is pretty cool, which is called Maluha by the yeah, Mesopotamians. Right, right, right. And they talk about the southern coast, probably of Iran, and possibly the Gulf, this land of Magan. So it's more a delta area then. Yeah, but I don't think, um, yeah, we, we don't get as far as Egypt at this point. Yeah, so it's not, not, not trade with Egypt. Okay. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, No, they're, they're really focused on northern Mesopotamia, western Iran, that sort of coastal area of Iran, Persian Gulf, and Indian Ocean. They're, weirdly, during this period of time, they seem to mostly be ignoring Egypt. And I've always wondered about that. You know, there's really little evidence for um, contact with Egypt. There's a lot of evidence earlier and later, but not for some reason during this period. Where's your research taking you next? <laughs> um, that's always a question I like to answer. We're, we're going back to Azerbaijan this, um, well, in May, so actually next month, which is a little scary for me. Um, and we're, we're actually digging a very different period. So we're actually looking at a site that's across from where I showed you guys. It's the major fortress in this area. And it's pretty much always a fortress except for this one period of time, and that's actually from about 200 BC to about 200 AD. And that's a period of time when this is pretty much a border zone between the Roman Empire and Parthia, kind of the Romans' main competitors. So we're going to excavate, we excavated bits of a house, of a couple houses before, but we want to excavate some houses, look at both what looks like the remains of a big villa and then also excavate some poorer houses and get a sense of how different people lived in this area during that time. With um, all the research in DNA, we now know that populations aren't stable. Conquerors come in and the male conquerors take over the population. Mm -hmm. um, are the people that lived in Azerbaijan when you were did your research, are they really closely related to the people who live there now, or were they different? I mean, we have no idea because we haven't done ancient DNA research here. Um, I mean, ancient DNA research is, is fiddly. Like, there are only a couple labs that do it. There's a lot of sort of things that have to be done. So as far as I know, none of it has been done yet in the Caucasus during these time periods, but it's definitely something that would be of interest, I think, to see... Um, especially 
in terms of the question of the creation of these fortresses, uh, the rise of the empire, you know, where are these people coming from? Are they, are there a lot of people who are closely related? Are they not? You know, like, are we getting people from all over? You know, we can at least get a sense that they're being born in other places, but what else is happening? All right, well, Lauren, you gave a great lead-in for Monday night's lecture, actually. Turi King will be here talking on King Richard's burial um, with the AIA. So go on the website if you haven't registered yet. Um, it's a free lecture here on Monday night at 6.15. So, wow. So thanks.